Good morning. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Keep doing that. We're going to get a rotation around here. <laughs> uh, Easter was last week, and of course, it's always a special time of the year, but we have to remember that every single day is a day to remember that he is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. I'm glad everyone uh, was able to blow into church today. The grass is getting greener, finally. God is good. And all the time. Amen. I invite you to stand as we call ourselves to worship this morning. Let us worship God, our light, and our salvation. We desire to live in God's house and to seek God in his holy temple. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen. Please turn your attention to our worship screen. Uh, hopefully we're not going to have any computer troubles today. We've been having some uh, issues, so hopefully it'll make it through the whole service. But we're going to sing Revive Us Again. often, especially in times such as this, revive us again, O Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, you have called each of us to a life of faith and obedience in you, a life of discipleship, and you promise to guide us and to lead us and to be our shepherd. You promise this because you love us and you willingly offered your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for our sins and that in him we might be cleansed and we might be pure and holy in your sight. And so as we come together in this hour of worship today, as your children purchased through the blood of Jesus, seeking to be filled anew with your divine love, we ask that you would open our hearts, open our minds to receive your life-giving truth. Revive us again, Lord God, and make us vessels of grace. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and God bless you for joining us for our television ministry today. Let's take a second and welcome each other.
Women's Choir always do such a nice job. And thank you to Sheila Epp for filling in today. It's always a treat to have you with us, very talented. Uh, of course, the, the truth of what they were singing about is that although millions have come, there's always room for one. Of course, we always know that, but you kind of created an interesting visual because we have the cross up here. And I'm not sure that one more could fit up here. <laughs> but thank you once again for singing for us today. Any announcements this morning? Um, if you happen to uh, complete the Boston Marathon, could you stand up for us? Anybody here today? Is that you, Greg Euchre? All right. <clears throat> What's that total? Is it 26.3 miles or something like that? 0.2? You know, it's quicker to drive. <laughs> yeah, right. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, is that the first time you've done that? Third time you've completed it. Wow. And what place, well, maybe you don't want to tell me what place you came in, but. 13,000th. 13,000th, hey. <laughs> just, you know, just participating is, is you know, that, that's a, quite, a, quite an accomplishment, so wonderful. And you're, you're feeling good? I imagine you're sore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you come back with an accent? Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's something to say that you've accomplished, so uh, very, very proud. No other prayer requests today? Any been, anybody been bothered by the wind? I don't know, I'm still a fairly young guy, I think, but I cannot remember a time in my life where it's been that windy for that long. It's almost biblical, isn't it? <laughs> we had a, a tree that... Uh, probably a very old tree that broke in the wind and smashed my chicken coop. <laughs> Luckily, it was unoccupied. Uh, thank you, raccoons. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> uh, but the wind, I tell you what, it almost, I've, obviously, I've seen pictures of the dirty 30s, but uh, we were driving around today, and it almost looked like some of those pictures that, that we've seen. It's quite something, but... And I don't know how that affects the farmers, you know, with all the planting and the, if it's affecting the topsoil and, and all that kind of stuff. But that's beyond my, my knowledge, but uh, I'm sure the farmers are probably concerned about that. But another prayer concern, unfortunately. Shall we go to the Lord? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your beauty, your amazing beauty that is beyond our comprehension. But the fingerprints of that beauty is all around us. Especially in the springtime in this area where we live, we get to see the, the world coming back to life, the grass turning green, the flowers begin to bloom. And Lord, those are your fingerprints. You are an amazing God. And it's just a small glimpse of the beauty that you truly are. So help us, Lord, as we enter into this new season to recognize that you are all around us. To know that you are a part of the creation you have made and this creation speaks of your glory and help us to recognize that and draw close to you. 
Father, you are good and your mercy endures forever. We know that we fall short of that glory even though we are redeemed by our Lord Jesus Christ. We often have need of confession. We often have need of repentance. And for whatever reason, Lord, we are reluctant to do that. And so we hold on to that truth that you tell us in your scriptures that when we do come to you in confession and repentance, that you are just. And your mercy forgives us and cleanses us anew, puts us back in a right standing with you. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and covered so that all you see when you look at us is him and the perfection that he provides for us. What a wonderful gift. And it's not only a gift that we can have in this life, but one that extends into the life to come. And so we all share that common hope of being with you forever. But to that end, Lord, we recognize that this life can sometimes be a challenging one. And for all those who are experiencing some of that difficulty, whether it's through health issues, financial difficulties, and all the worries that might come with that, especially in uncertain times that we face, we pray, Lord, for your peace. Sometimes we need to be reminded that this world is not victorious, that Jesus has already conquered the world. Help us, Lord, to live in that victory, even with the things that are happening around us. Help us to be reminded once again that we are the children of God and that there is nothing that can take us from that place and the status that we have been given in Jesus. Father, we pray for your hand to be active in the lives of so many who need your touch today. We're thankful for answered prayer and for the progress that many of those that have been on our prayer list have made in these past weeks and months. We know that prayer is a gift and that your will is done through that answered gift. And so, Father, we want to especially pray for those in physical need. We think of Amy, as Shirley has pointed out to us, in the accident that she's been involved in. We don't know why accidents happen, Lord. They're unexplainable to us. But we also know that when we do experience difficulties like that, that they can become opportunities for us to draw near to you. And, and those people who, who are praying for Amy, it's an opportunity for them to draw near to you too. May your will be done, Lord. May your healing mercy touch her. May you provide wonderful care for her, not only for those who are dealing with her in the medical world, but also those who are just simply there to be encouragement and to share their love. We know that all healing comes from you. And so we praise you in advance for the work that you will be doing in her life. Father, we think about those who are preparing to get into the fields. And we know, Lord, that in our part of the country, the crop production is such a, a vital part of our survival. And so we just ask for your mercy to be with our farmers, with our land. We know the winds have been pretty difficult and perhaps they're starting to cause some issues. But Lord, you are the Lord of the harvest. All we can do is plant the seed and everything else is up to you. It's a reminder, Lord, that all things are in your hands. So help us, Lord, to once again be a people of faith, to look to you to provide for us. Not only have you provided for us in this life, but as we mentioned already, we have the hope of heaven, a hope that the world does not share. And yet we're surrounded each and every day by those people who are still part of this world, who don't have that hope and, and therefore have nothing to look forward to except for damnation and judgment. So help us, Lord, to be your church, the, the church that you have called us to be, to make disciples of all nations and to teach them about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that they too might share our hope and be part of the family of God. Lord, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Help us to walk in the new life that you have provided for us, especially in this week after Easter, how quickly we forget the joy of that first Easter morning and the truth that Jesus has risen from the dead and has conquered life, given us life, a resurrection life that we might share in it. Help us, Lord, to live that resurrection life and to live all things for your glory and for your namesake. 
We pray these things in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Three in your pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along, Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 through 27. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as it charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against it, and none could rescue from its power. It did, it, did as it pleased and became great. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. It came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at it in great rage. I saw it attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against it. The goat knocked it to the ground and trampled on it, and none could rescue the ram from its power. The goat became very great, but at the height of its power, the large horn was broken off, and in its place four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry host down and out to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord, and his sanctuary was thrown down. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it, it prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take before the vision, for the vision to be fulfilled? Rather, The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary, and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. He said to me, It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. While I, Daniel, was watching this vision, the vision, and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice calling from the Ulai, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia, Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation but will not have the same power. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. 
He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you is true, but seal up the vision for it concerns the distant future. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. This is the word of the Lord. As we continue to make our way through the book of Daniel, it might seem like some of these chapters are simply covering the same ground that we've already covered over and over again, right? We've seen a few times now in Daniel's uh, prophecy that he's given glimpses into the future and sees various world empires that will come into existence, beginning with the Babylonian Empire and finally concluding with the Roman Empire. We've also seen how these visions of world history connect with the final empire, which of course is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that day is coming. So this morning, we seem to be once again covering the same ground of prophetic vision of these kingdoms. I think a reasonable question is to ask, why does the book of Daniel do this? Why does God inspire Daniel to keep documenting these prophetic pictures of world empires? And from what I can gather, I think we can essentially provide two reasons for this. The first reason has to do with Daniel himself and the Jewish people that he is a part of. Remember that Daniel's situation is that he was taken captive to Babylon as a result of God's judgment on the nation for forsaking their relationship with him. This is what we call the Babylonian captivity, which is a judgment that lasts for a period of 70 years. And this way, the prophetic picture of the future uh, is given to Daniel so that he and the nation will know that God has something else in store for them. In a basic sense, it gives the people the reassurance that God is still in control, no matter what is happening around them, and that he indeed has a future for his people. And the second reason is similar to the first in that it speaks to us, to you and me, a people of faith who have existed throughout the centuries that are different than the Jewish people. We're the Gentiles, but we're Gentiles of faith. Not only does the book of Daniel speak to the people who are currently experiencing God's judgment and ultimate restoration, but it speaks to you and me as well as we can find assurance that God is indeed in control and that he has a future plan for us as well. What we can notice is that the instances that spoke of the coming world powers in the previous chapters gave us kind of a generalized picture of that particular scene. Chapter 7, which looked at, uh, we looked at a few weeks ago, seems like a long time ago already, that introduced us to this figure that we called the little horn, or the Antichrist who puts himself into power at the end of the age. What we will notice now as we move through these remaining chapters of the book of Daniel is the, the generalization starts to now narrow in focus. And we are given more and more specific information about certain things, which of course includes this person that we call the Antichrist. The chapter before us this morning begins narrowing that process and we can see that it has specific rele relevance for, for Daniel's people, Jews. They are mentioned specifically, as we will see, and this particular vision concerns both the, the, the not-so-distant future for the Jews, but also a distant future, one that concerns you and me. And for Daniel, of course, that would have been the distant future. But at the outset, I want to point out something that is uh, mentioned here in verse 1 that will help us gain clarity into another part of the book of Daniel. This is how chapter 8 opens. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign... I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. Now, why is that important? Well, because Daniel tells us that this vision took place while King Belshazzar was still in power. You remember King Belshazzar, don't you? He, uh, he was the one from chapter 5 who was the king who gave what we called the sin party, uh, the blasphemous party where the hand of God appeared and declared judgment on the Babylonian kingdom. He wrote on the wall... Many, many tekel uparsin. Everybody remember what that meant? 
That's okay, you don't have to. There's no quiz at the end. It was Daniel who was called into the feast in order to give the king the interpretation of this writing. No one else, not even the wise men, understood what it meant. And by what Daniel says here in verse 1 of chapter 8, we can gain insight into just how Daniel knew about what was going to happen to the Babylonian kingdom and the, the kingdom that would ultimately replace them. Now, perhaps Daniel didn't know when this was going to take place, but if you recall, it was shortly after Daniel interpreted the writing as the judgment of God that the Medo-Persian Empire invaded and took control of the city of Babylon. So in the context of this vision, Daniel is shown by God things that have not yet happened. Now, we've already made similar points in our study of Daniel, but this is yet another reminder that the foreknowledge of God reveals future events as though they are history. I know that's a big concept to get our minds around because you and I are limited to our understanding because of what we call time and space, right? Our reality is now and what we can see directly in front of us. And yet God does not share in our limitations. God is eternal, which means he has no beginning, he has no ending. Of course, that is another concept that is hard for us as mere human beings to handle. But because God is outside of time, it means that in his foreknowledge, he can see, he can th see things that have not yet happened as though they have already happened. And what that means is that God can, can say things like he says in, in the book of Jeremiah. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. How can something be known and set apart before it's even physically in existence? From a human perspective, that notion is just simply impossible. We can't do that. But God can. In the mind of God, all things are known. Things that are in existence and things that have yet to be in existence. Now, I don't know that we'll ever fully understand the mind of God in this life and, and some of those more incomprehensible sorts of things about God. But the important thing for us here is that God already knows the future and he has decided to share part of that future with Daniel in the form of a vision. I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me, that is chapter 7, the last one we looked at. And in my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. Well, what we are to understand is that Daniel was not sleeping in his bed when God granted him this vision. This was something else. This was an overwhelming of the mind, which caused Daniel to become unaware of his surroundings as this vision sort of unfolded before him. He maybe just stood there looking in a, in a kind of a stupor even, I don't know. But it wasn't a, a sleepy vision. And the vision contains two primary actors, or in this case, beasts. We've seen beasts before. The first thing that he sees is a ram with a set of uneven horns. That is, one of the horns was taller than the other. The ram charged around in the different directions, trampling over the land to the point that nothing could control it. Nothing, that is, until Daniel sees yet another beast that comes onto the scene. There's a ram that comes to attack. And the second beast, or rather, is a shaggy goat. It's a he-goat. And the odd part, about, odd part about this animal is that it had one large horn right in the middle of its head. And it moved so fast that it appeared not even to be touching the ground. And in a furious rage, this he-goat charged the ram and shattered two of its horns, stomped it all over the earth. And as Daniel says, nothing could rescue the ram from the he-goat's power. Quite a violent vision so far. Probably an unsettling vision. But Daniel continues to watch. This he-goat, uh, he rather, grew larger and larger and larger until it seemed that nothing could stop the power of this goat. But in a strange turn of events, at the height of the goat's power and fury, perhaps we could say, a great tragedy happened to the goat. A large single horn on the he-goat's head simply broke off. And in its place grew four different horns. The horns all seemed to point in different directions. And in addition to these horns, yet another horn began to grow out of these, these four that grew up. At first, it was just a small horn. But then it began to grow, and it grew in size, and it grew in power, even towards what Daniel describes as the beautiful land. In fact, it grew so much that it seemed like it touched the heavens themselves. 
Here Daniel tells us that the horn actually grew so powerful that it threw some of the starry host of heaven to the ground and trampled on it. Quite a scene. But the horn didn't stop there. It set itself up to try to be on par with God himself. And as it concerned the people of God, the Jews, the horn took away the daily sacrifices being made to God and threw down the sanctuary. It seems at this time, many of the people of Israel actually turned toward the horn in worship and turned away from God so that the people actually started making sacrifices to the horn itself. Quite a blasphemous thing to do. And as Daniel looked on, it appeared that everything the horn did just made it more powerful, stronger and stronger and stronger. And I think what we have to remember is that Daniel is receiving these visions while he is already a captive in Babylon. And the reason for this captivity is because the people of God had forsaken the law of God. They've forsaken their relationship with God and turned to idol worship and pagan practices. So this must have been heartbreaking for Daniel to see his people once again in this vision, turning away from God and turning towards this mysterious horn in false worship. But isn't that human nature? We, we learn lessons. Well, we don't learn lessons, actually. It takes a long time for us to let something sink, sink in. That's our sinful nature. How many times do God's people need to experience his judgment before they finally get it, before they finally remain faithful and nothing can pull them away? For some reason, human nature tempts us to turn away from our creator so that we give our worship to something else. And in fact, those something else's can be just about anything. There's lots of things that we try to get to replace God, isn't there? Despite the 70 years of God's judgment, Daniel sees yet another failure in the future by God's people. And although, as we will see, these strange animal figures are once again symbols of certain empires, we can also see how this vision begins to narrow in focus. And it demonstrates how these things relate to the Jewish people themselves. This isn't what might happen. That's not what this is when it concerns God's prophecy. This is, this is something that will happen. It is certain because God in his infinite wisdom sees the beginning from the end and everything in between. He knows all the details. The foreknowledge of God allows future events to be revealed as though they are history. But we can also recognize is this. Despite the reality of evil in this world, God is always in control. Have you ever forgotten that? The main portion of this vision is now complete. Daniel hears a couple of angels talking with one another who apparently are also watching this vision sort of unfold. And one asks the other, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? This vision concerning the daily sacrifices, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary, and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. There again, there's the Jews. Now to be clear, prophetic visions are not meant for angels. Angels don't need them. Prophetic visions are meant for human understanding, for us. Now perhaps Daniel is too simply uh, overwhelmed by what he has seen, so the angel basically asks the question that he should have asked for him, how long before this is going to be fulfilled? Notice in verse 14, Daniel says, he said to me, before the angels were talking to themselves, but now one turns to Daniel and addresses him directly. He says to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, and then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. In other words, from the time of the rise of this little horn until its final removal from power is going to be 2,300 evenings and 2,300 mornings. In other words, 2,300 days. Roughly six and a half years, depending on which calendar you were using and how you understood that. There's a Babylonian calendar that only had 360 days in it. The text seems pretty straightforward on this point. But the problem is how to fit that period of time within history itself and the understanding of the future as it relates to the final consummation of God's kingdom on earth, right? I'm not going to bore you with all the technical discussions about this other than to say that in, it is my conclusion, and it's mine only, that this period of time, these 2,300 days, has nothing to do with future events regarding the last days. It doesn't have anything to do with it but is entirely dealing with something that is, for us, now ancient history. 
In particular, it has to do with the reign of one particular man, and his name is Antiochus Epiphanes, who did some absolutely awful things to the people of God before the time that the New Testament was written, before the time of Jesus. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but for now, I want to concentrate on what happens to Daniel after he sees this vision. The angels are conversing with one another, and one of the angels turns to Daniel He says, while I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man, and I heard a man's voice calling from the Uli, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. Daniel was essentially standing in a stupor about these things that had passed before his eyes, when suddenly an angel appears next to him, and a voice calls out, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. And in this verse, for the first time in scripture, an angel is actually identified by name. Gabriel is the chosen messenger of God. And he's going to show up again in the book of Daniel. Now just in case you're under the the belief that angels are just nothing more than chubby little baby-like figures who play a harp while sitting on a fluffy white cloud, Daniel is going to give us a slightly different picture of angels here. As he came near... Daniel says, the place where I was standing, I was terrified and I fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. And he touched me and he raised me to my feet. To put that in terms that we can understand, Daniel was so terrified by the angel that he fainted. His face fell to the ground. It wasn't a scary fear that so overwhelmed Daniel, but rather it was a holy fear that overwhelmed him. You and I have probably never experienced anything like that. But the fact of the matter is that the angels stand in the presence of God himself. And when angels appear to human beings, even the afterglow, if we could call it that, of God's holiness, from being in the presence of God is so great that no human being can stand to be in that presence. They're terrified of it. We can see something a little bit similar in the life of Moses when he would go up to the mountain on behalf of the people and speak to God. And when he would come back down, they had to put a veil over his face because the people couldn't stand to even look at him. That was just from simply being in the presence of God. The holiness of God was reflecting and the people just couldn't stand that. But the angel here comforts Daniel. He helps him to his feet and he informs them that he's now going to give Daniel the meaning of this vision that has so concerned him. But the concerning part of what Gabriel tells Daniel is this. He said, I am going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. That is to say, what Gabriel is about to tell Daniel has to do with the wrath of God once again poured out on his people because of their sinful and wayward acts, their false worship, their idol worship. We've already seen that God uses wicked and pagan rulers for his own purposes. We saw how God used Nebuchadnezzar himself as a tool to bring about his judgment on his people. And here we see again that no matter who is in power and which kingdom or empire is controlling the world, the ultimate power belongs to God himself, always. It's another reminder that despite the reality of evil that's in this world, that God is in control of all things. I think that's something that we need to be reminded of often, don't, don't you? You ever felt like when you watch the news that God is in control of anything? You listen to the radio and you listen to all the things that are happening in this world and you kind of go, where is God? Has he abandoned us? And the answer is no, he hasn't. God is in control of all things, always. And along with that reminder is this very important truth No matter the strength of evil that exists in this world, God's victory is certain. The angel is now going to give Daniel the interpretation of what he has seen. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is its first king. Now we're going to stop right there for a second. The angel has just identified for us the kingdoms that are involved in this vision directly. I said earlier that this chapter of Daniel is is narrowing its focus on future events that directly concern the people of Israel. Some of you know that in Catholic Bibles, there are a series of books, 14 I believe there are, 
that are not in what we might call our Protestant versions of Scripture. Raise your hand if you knew that. All right. <laughs> These extra books have a name. They're called the Apocrypha, and they contain books that deal with various subjects. There are two books in the Apocrypha that deal with the history of Israel and the centuries just before the writing of the New Testament. We call it the intertestamental period. I want to read you the opening verses of a book called First Maccabees, which was written in the second century BC. Some of you are going, we're actually reading from the book of First Maccabees today in church? Yeah, we are. This is what it says. After Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, who came from the land of Kittim, had defeated King Darius of the Persians and the Medes, he succeeded him as king. Now, in case you didn't catch that, uh, kind of a boring little subject of history, this is a Jewish historian writing in the second century who tells us precisely about the kingdoms who were in power up to that time. We know about the Medo-Persian Empire. We've heard about that before. And as we just read in 1 Maccabees, it was Alexander the Great, and they, named by, they actually call him Alexander, who came to defeat King Darius of the Medes and the Persians. The opening verses of the book go on to say, he gathered a very strong army, that is uh, Alexander, and he ruled over countries, nations, and princes, and they became a tributary to him. After this, he fell sick and perceived that he was dying, so he summoned his most honored officers, who had been with him since his youth, and he divided his kingdom among them while he was still alive. And after Alexander had reigned 12 years, he died. And his officers began to rule each in his own place. They all put crowns on their head after his death. And so did their descendants after them for many years. And they caused many evils on the earth. Here we're told in Maccabees about Alexander's death. And how the Greek empire was divided amongst those who had been close to Alexander. And the interesting part about that is that what did Gabriel just say to us? The two-horned ram you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. In verse 22, Gabriel even says, The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. The prophetic vision of Daniel matches perfectly with what actually happened in history. However, we now come to the more controversial aspect of Daniel's vision in chapter 8. Gabriel tells Daniel, in the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people of God. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. And when they feel secure, he will destroy many. In other words, when he preaches peace... That is when he comes in and destroys many. And he will take his stand against the prince of princes, yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. The problem for us is that thus far in the book of Daniel, we have identified this little horn as the Antichrist who comes from that fourth kingdom, which we also identified as the Roman Empire, not the Greek Empire. This little horn comes from, as we've already seen here, one of the horns that emerge after the death of Alexander the Great. And further, Gabriel has made it clear that the vision concerns the appointed time of the end, that future end, the end of time, that moment in history when God's, uh, God's kingdom will be established finally on this earth. So if that is the case, then how do we reconcile this little horn from, from chapter 7 with the Roman Empire with this little horn from chapter 8 with the Greek Empire? There is lots and lots and lots of debate about this, and I'm not going to get into all those potential answers because we would never leave. So let me just summarize what seems to be the best understanding of this. Remember again that this chapter is dealing with the, the future of the Jews in particular. I mentioned a name earlier that I'm going to expand a bit upon now because it gives us a very clear picture of what happened. The name I mentioned was Antiochus Epiphanes. Just wondering how the subtitle generator is going to hear that when I say that. Antiochus Epiphanes later on when I do the editing. That's a problem for later. This was a man who emerged from the Greek nation after Alexander. He was an absolutely ruthless man who hated 
God's people. He hated the Jews. In fact, in his conquest, he turns his sight towards Jerusalem or the beautiful land, as we read about in Daniel's vision here. And when he had conquered Jerusalem, he completely defiled the city, even sacrificing pigs on the altar of God. You might remember how fond Jews are of pigs. He forbade the Jews from worshiping God. He made it illegal, essentially. And he even convinced many of them to offer sacrifices to him as a pagan ruler. If you want to read more about this man, Antiochus Epiphanes, you can find all sorts of information about him once again in the first uh, book of Maccabees. But I do want to read you just a small portion of it so that we can tie in to what Gabriel says here to Daniel. It says, From them came forth a sinful root, Antiochus Epiphanes, son of King Antiochus. He had been a hostage in Rome. He began to reign in the 137th year of the kingdom of the Greeks. And it continues by telling us how Antiochus raided the temple and took all the holy vessels, just as Nebuchadnezzar had done before him. Two years later, the king sent to the cities of Judah a chief collector of tribute, and he came to Jerusalem with a large force. Deceitfully, he spoke peaceable words to them. He came in peace. And they believed him. They thought he was bringing peace. But suddenly, he fell upon the city, dealt it a severe blow, and destroyed many people in Israel. He plundered the city, burned it with fire, and tore down its houses and its surrounding walls. They took captive the women and children and seized the livestock. They fortified the city of David with a great strong wall and towers, and it became their citadel. A citadel of Satan, we might say. God's holy city was completely occupied by this evil man. Worship was forbidden. The temple was desecrated. Now, taking this Jewish history into account, we can see that Gabriel's interpretation of Daniel's vision is exactly what happened to God's people. Further, we can say that the time of the terror and the defilement of Jerusalem is God's way of telling us about what's going to happen in the future. The reign of Antiochus was roughly six and a half years or we might say a period of about 2,300 days, just as Daniel's vision had demonstrated for us. But the question still remains, how does Antiochus fit with the little horn of the last days if his reign is already ancient history for us? I think the answer is that Antiochus is simply a typological representation of the future world leader who, that will be in power just before the kingdom of Christ is established on this earth once and for all. The reason I think that really has something to do with what we read in the book of uh, one of the letters from, from John. In 1 John, we read this. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. This was the second century, A.D. And he said, even now, that spirit of Antichrist is already with us. What that means is that the spirit of Antichrist has been around for a millennia, over a millennia, many millennia. And throughout history, that same kind of spirit that is manifest in hatred for God and hatred for God's people and hatred for God's law is sometimes concentrated and manifest in a particular world leader who comes to power. Have we seen that in history? Anybody remember World War II? Antiochus is one of those manifestations of that future Antichrist who won't fully be manifest in this world until we get to that, that final beast, that final little horn that comes from the last... Gentile world power. Now, because this topic can tend to be rather difficult and heavy, anybody feel heavy? I want to point out what Gabriel tells Daniel, and this is something that is important for each of us to catch and to hold on to. Even though Antiochus and later the Antichrist will take his stand against God's people and even the prince of princes, yet he will be destroyed. Gabriel says, and not by human power. What does history tell us happened to the mighty and evil Antiochus Epiphanes? Well, Maccabees tells us that he simply got sick and died, very generally. Other sources say that he got some sort of a fever and eventually died from some awful Ill illness that involved rot and maggots. <laughs> Sounds pleasant, doesn't it? The fact of the matter is that Antiochus died. He was judged in the sovereignty of God's power. 
The 2300 days of his reign came to an end and both the city and the temple of God were restored. For us, it's a reminder that no matter the strength of the evil that exists in this world, God's victory is certain. It's always certain. And that is something that we can cling to no matter what is happening in the world around us. God's victory is always certain. This chapter closes by saying, I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. I can echo Daniel's sentiment and say, I, Pastor Shane, was worn out. Spending so much time studying the presence of evil in every age takes its toll on a person. It wears on you both mentally, it wears on you spiritually, and I think that is the danger of studying books like Daniel. If we allow the negative to overshadow the greater and larger message, what is the larger message? That no evil, no power, either human or otherworldly, can ever alter the glorious future that God has in store for the faithful. It's easy to get caught up in the details of prophetic messages, especially when studying these intriguing and horrifying figures like the little horn. But God's revelation to prophets like Daniel is to remind us that our salvation does not come from any world power, no, no person. It doesn't matter how powerful they might try to be or claim to be in this earth. Our salvation comes from God himself. Our hope is in the Lord. It is by his hand that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of God and of his Christ. And that is the faith lesson that we can learn, I think, from Daniel chapter 8. God's victory is sure. The outcome is certain. And that means that our victory and our eternal inheritance is also sure. It is Certain. Is that hard to remember? Sometimes it is, isn't it? But God has prepared a place for each one of us. And that is our hope. That is our salvation. Praise be to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we have acknowledged many times that the book of Daniel is sometimes difficult for us. The topic is one that as Daniel points out, can cause us to feel heavy, can wear us out. So help us, Lord, to remember once again that our concentration should not be on the Antichrist. Our focus should always, always be on our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to live for him and to to have that power dwelling in us manifest itself so that no matter what we're facing in this life, we know that we are secure. You have prepared a place for us. And it's a place that cannot be altered and cannot be changed. We thank you, Lord, for your love and for your patience with us. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But until that time, help us to be faithful in sharing your message of love. And we ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.